everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Today we're looking at pre pregnancy and MS. Your presenter for today's webinar is Associate Professor Annika van der Walt, and I'm your facilitator and my name's Andrea Salmon. We start all our webinars by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians past and present on whose lands we meet and we acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country. We also respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. Let me introduce you to our presenter today. Associate Professor Annika van der Walt is a neurologist at Alfred Health in Melbourne, where she's appointed as the head of MS and neuro-ophthalmology. Annika leads the MS and neuro-ophthalmology research group at the Central Clinical School of Monash University. She had completed her undergraduate training in South Africa before relocating to Australia where she completed specialist training in neurology and a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Melbourne. Annika's research interests include treatment of MS tremor, better monitoring of cerebellar dysfunction in MS and MS cognition. She has a keen interest in women's health in MS as well as symptom management in people with MS which places her very well for today's topic of pregnancy in MS. So I'm just going to pass control over to Annika so she can do her slides as needed. And then Annika will share her screen. Okay, well, welcome everyone um, for this afternoon session. Um, so, I am very pleased to um, be doing this webinar. I did this a few years ago and it's about time that we um, updated some of the information. So I'm going to take you through um, sort of various aspects about family planning, um, MS in pregnancy, and a little bit about breastfeeding in, in women um, with MS. These are my disclosures. So I've received um, travel support and also research support from a number of pharmaceutical companies, all of these without strings attached. So I guess why do we talk about MS and pregnancy and why is it so important? And it is because, of course, because MS affects um, women in their um, prime um, reproductive years. Um, the other thing is that MS affects more women than men and that this sort of ratio of women being affected more than men is slowly climbing for some reason. And it's um, sometimes we don't quite know why that is. So. Um, if you look at um, the graph here on the left of your screen, you would see that um, the southern hemisphere is the graph on the bottom. Um, and over time, it's sort of slowly been increasing, but not as much as it does on the northern hemisphere, which is this one on the top. If we look at data from Australia, so this is the table that's displayed, which is um, data from Newcastle. Um, and you can see that if we look at um, the incidence um, in, in, of MS in the 1970, 1971 to 1981, it was much lower than it is now. It's now sitting at about 6.7 um, per 100,000 people. Um, and the sex ratio is increasing. So more women are, are being affected. Um, and this is something that's not quite well understood. So if we think about, you know, um, you know, women with MS, there's of course lots of things to consider um, around um, pregnancy, but also around contraception, sexual function, work and relationships, parenting and bladder and bowel dysfunction. Uh, um, and it's, um, you know, always good to think about all of these things holistically um, rather than just one aspect. But of course, for today's um, purpose, we're mostly going to be talking about pregnancy um, and how um, different things that can um, interplay when you want to get pregnant or if you're pregnant already. So our case that we're going to base this on is a 28-year-old woman with relapsing remitting um, MS that's been stable on Fingolimod or Kulenia for a long time, but she recently got married and she's concerned about getting pregnant. So she has... Um, you know, but despite this, she's not using contraception because she feels that the periods are regular and she thought that maybe that was because of MS. She also wants to try um, IVF with a donor egg because she's um, really worried about her children having MS. Um, and then, you know, is very worried um, be, um, that she won't be able to look after, you know, any kids that she might have later on because she might become disabled. So 
So this is, of course, um, you know, worries, I think, that flashes through people's heads sometimes. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, not, not most people won't try IVF with a donor egg necessarily. So they don't really need to. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of worries and anxiety around uh, parenting and motherhood in general and um, having MS as an extra um, tag is going to make things just that bit more complicated. So before we talk about um, pregnancy, uh, firstly just about contraception. So obviously there's many different methods available. Um, this is the oral contraceptive pill and any hormonal contraceptive. So there's luckily no drug interactions um, between the drugs that we have available and contraceptions. The, ex the, the possible exception would be terafunamide or Baggio, which uh, might actually increase the peak concentrations of estrogen and levonorgestrel, which is a progesterone in the pool. Um, but it, it's not really, you know, that's either going to make it more effective than less effective. Um, and sometimes um, people who want to wash out terafunamide go on to activate it charcoal or a medication called cholestyramine to wash this medication out of your system and that can actually mop up the pool as well so but that's pretty much the only thing of course you know many people choose to use injectable contraceptives or a um, IUD um, and all of these things are completely suitable for MS and, and, and people are you know free to choose whatever suits them the best. So if we think about common questions that we receive in the clinic, um, you know, there's often about um, MS and fertility. Um, how does pregnancy affect MS? You know, will people, will you get more relapses? Um, could it actually make your MS worse in the long run? So could you have an increased risk of becoming progressive? Um, does pregnancy cause MS? Um, or is there any benefits related to pregnancy and MS? Um, does MS affect the pregnancy outcome? So is that the baby going to be any different just because you have MS while you're pregnant? Um, and then there's, of course, a lot of questions about medication um, around pregnancy, breastfeeding as well. Um, and then sometimes there's also this concern about the risk of the child getting MS. So if we start with fertility, um, so there's not a lot of studies that's looked at fertility in people with MS. Um, and... All the studies in particular have shown that women with MS are more likely not to have children than the general population. But it's you know, quite possible um, that these studies that are quite old um, was because of choice um, rather than someone not being able to get pregnant. Um, and also, you know, for quite a long time in the you know, 1980s and 1990s, there was a perception that, you know, women with MS should not get pregnant, that it's too risky um, and all that sort of thing. And that certainly changed dramatically over the last um, decade, at least. Um, the other thing that we know is that spontaneous miscarriages is not this any higher um, than in women with MS than the general population. So it's, um, you know, the standard miscarriage rate is, is quoted to be about 20 to 25%. Um, and that is really the same. Um, so if we look at studies looking at, you know, if you, if you can um, struggle to conceive because of MS. So um, there's a, a reasonably good study that was published um, from France in 2017, 2015, where they compared um, the number of children that people with MS had to um, the um, population data, the statistics from the French data, um, the, the population data in France. Um, and what you could see is that um, the mean number of children, so the average number of children, the blue is a woman with MS, you can see that it's slightly lower um, than people without MS. Um, but interestingly, they found that there was no difference in how long it took someone to get pregnant, whether they had MS or not MS, or before or after their diagnosis with MS, which is really reassuring. Um, and it took about eight months for most people to get pregnant. No evidence, so there was really no evidence that there's any primary issues with fertility um, because of MS. Um, and I think if someone with MS is struggling to get pregnant, it is, however, good to think about other factors um, that could be interfering with them getting pregnant. So particularly to do with sexual function, um, you know, making sure they haven't developed another autoimmune disease like a thyroid problem or something like that as well. Um, but other than that, you know, this is not something that um, 
you know, is going to be MS related in particular. So I guess the take home message is that women and men with MS have fewer pregnancies and, ch um, and, ch and children than people unaffected by MS. Um, but this could again be most likely because of, you know, people's choices. Um, and then to think about other things that could be uh, um, contributing to someone not, get and getting, not getting pregnant. So if we move on to pregnancy and how it actually affects MS itself and disease, the disease cause of MS, so in terms of relapses in particular, or the amount of difficulty someone might accumulate over time, um, we often refer to this very classical um, graph. Um, so this one um, was published in 1998. And before this period, this is when people still thought very much that people, women with MS should not get pregnant. But what this show it shows showed, and it's been you know replicated now a few times by different groups of researchers, is that um, if we look at how many relapses someone would have in a year, so this is on the y-axis, and we look at say um, the year before someone gets pregnant, you can see that during the pregnancy, so this is the grey block, the, the the relapse rate actually decreases, and it actually is the lowest in the third trimester. Um, and then interestingly, in the first three months, so in the first trimester after the baby is born, the relapse rate can actually increase with about a third from what it was before the pregnancy. Um, and then it sort of takes a bit of time, you know, a year or more to slowly come back to what it was before. So this is also taking into account that this doesn't take into account people being on disease modifying treatment or anything like that. But I guess um, what we generally can see is that, um, you know, the relapse rate decreases during pregnancy and the first three months after pregnancy in particular, there's a, about a 30% increased risk of getting a relapse. Now, um, is there a way to predict, um, you know, to know if what someone's risk is to have that surge in relapse activity after the baby's birth? And this has also been looked at in quite a bit of detail now. Um, and this graph here is sort of a similar graph, but what you can see here is that there's three lines um, and the line um, at the um, bottom with the little circles is people who's not been on any disease modifying treatment. And the big line um, is people who's had um, higher, um, been on high efficacy drugs. So this would be like Fingolimod, Nathanitai Sabri, um, ocrelizumab or ocrevus, um, tecfidera, that sort of treatment. Um, and what we can see is that the main things that will show us if someone has had an increased risk of developing a relapse after pregnancy is if what the, is, is, is it's very much determined about how many relapses they had in the year or two before they got pregnant. Um, it's also determined, you know, decreased if someone is on high efficacy treatment. So this graph is a bit in the opposite. So you can see that you want the relapse rate reduction, the relapse rate to be lower, um, and being on medication helps for that. Um, if you have a very long washout period before you get pregnant, then that could also increase your risk. Um, if you exclusive breastfeeding actually can decrease the risk of having a relapse. Um, and by exclusive breastfeeding, we'll talk about this a bit more, but this means sort of, um, you know, exclusive breastfeeding, no other um, feeds to the baby for six months. Um, also, if you have um, already got a little bit of um, dysfunction that you've accumulated, and this is, you know, an EDS is of more than two, meaning that, you know, there's just some mild dysfunction that is noticeable to the person with MS. Um, already then that could also actually um, have an adverse effect. So, so I guess we're just sort of starting to understand this a little bit better. Um, the other thing I think is good to think about is just what about miscarriages um, or elective terminations? Does that have the same risk in terms of creating that post um, event surge and relapse activity than a full term um, not interrupted pregnancy? Um, and this is also something that's been increasingly looked at. So in this study, um, they looked at 188 events um, and they looked at people who had post-abortion relapses. So whether it was spontaneous or, in, or, or um, elected. Um, and basically what they found again is that there is a um, increased risk again um, of relapses in that little, in the period just after this. This has also been um, shown in the activity um, 
that we've looked at in the MS base study um, where we found that you know the risk of relapses after a miscarriage or a termination um, is the same um, whether it's you know that or an you know, uninterrupted pregnancy so you know it's just important to be aware of that because these things are not uncommon um, and you know you, you you may be at risk of an increased um, you know more have more risk of a relapse during this period so the take-home message is that pregnancy generally has a really favorable effect on relapse rate um, and it is the low the relapse rate is the lowest towards the, the start of the third trimester and the relapse rate can increase in the first three months afterwards and it can take a while for this relapse rate to settle down again um, up to two years sometimes remembering that this of course is information in the absence of someone starting back on treatment um, how someone function and how much much neurological problems they accumulate um, because of pregnancy and afterwards is, is pretty um, it remains pretty stable with no increase um, and I guess you know in terms of preventing any of these relapses it is best to if if possible to go into a pregnancy stable so meaning that you know the more the disease can be controlled before you get pregnant the the less likely you will be to have a relapse during the pregnancy or after the pregnancy um, and you know relapses even if they may not be always that severe can of course be very upsetting especially if you you know dealing with a newborn um, and yeah, with you know being on a disease modifying treatment or breastfeeding, um, you know, exclusively may actually also help a little bit. So why is that so? Why does um, MS, you know, why is pregnancy the relapse rate in pregnancy reduced? Um, and it probably is because of changes in the immune system that's um, you know driven by the hormonal surges and the high hormone levels that someone would experience during pregnancy. Um, and it's all to do with um, really evolutionary design to protect the fetus from rejection. So your immune system is sort of down-regulated so that it doesn't um, you know, re recognize the fetus or the baby as a foreign object that will be attacked or rejected by the immune system. Um, and by doing that, uh, by this normal physiological process, it also dampens down the inflammation cause of MS. So, so, so this is, of course, very interesting in terms of the immunology of it um, and asking if pregnancy can actually then protect against getting MS is also a very interesting question and it's been looked at um, in a number of studies as well. Um, so I guess what we know, what we know of, um, a lot of this information comes from a long, a long study that was done in Australia. Um, called the Oz immune study. And what this, um, the investigators of the study did is they collected people who had their first ever um, episode of MS or FDE and looked and compared them to people without MS, really. And they had more controls than people with um, a first simulating episode. And then they looked back over their history, you know, their lifetime, really, and they recorded all pregnancies that they may have had. And they identified um, 282 cases, of which 216 were female, um, and for, they had 422 controls, which were female, and, and the total group was 542. And interestingly, what they found is the more births someone has had, the less likely they were to have another, um, to have this first episode of MS. So if you look back at someone's history, if they um, has had at least one birth, the risk of that um, episode, first attack of MS reduces, and they quoted a reduction of almost 50%. And someone who's had five births, five life births, so their sort of episode, um, their risk of another episode of MS was, you know, very like much, like, much lower. Um, so you can see almost by 94% there. So it's, um, you know, certainly has, has an interesting effect on the immune system. But I, I guess, um, you know, you can't keep people pregnant. So we do have to look at other ways. But I think all of this information has been incredibly reassuring for um, people with MS and, and doctors looking after people with MS to know that it's a really not a contraindication, MS is not a contraindication to have a baby. Um, so, 
So the other thing that um, is what, that I wanted to show you is basically a study that um, that was done again using the MS Base data. MS Base is a massive data registry. It has almost 64,000 people's information about the MS in there. Um, and researchers can use this to do very powerful analyses to answer real questions about that we have about you know how people with MS do in the real world. So in this study, what they looked at is can we predict um, if someone is going to become worse? So if they're going to get ne their neurological function will deteriorate over 10 years. Is there any way to predict which people will get worse over the first 10 years? Um, and this study included um, 1,800 people with MS. Um, and what they looked at is, um, you know, they looked at age and how long someone has had MS for. But the things that appear to reduce the risk of having, um, be getting worse um, um, over 10 years was firstly the percentage of time that someone spent on, um, in this study, they only had interferon beta and determa acetate. So if you, um, reduced, uh, if you were on those medications for longer during the period of time, you had almost a 30% decreased risk of becoming worse over 10 years. But the interesting thing is that if you became, if you actually spent a, lo a lot of time of this 10 years pregnant, you actually almost had a four and a half times less risk of becoming worse. Um, than um, if not. So this is almost, you know, four and a half times um, stronger. This effect is four and a half times stronger than, um, than, than, than platform, than therapies with interferon beta and glatoroma acetate, which again just shows you the immunological benefits of pregnancy. And I'm not advocating at all that everyone should get pregnant, but if that is something that you foresee for yourself and that you want to do, there's certainly no reason not to do it. So, so, and again, that, that's sort of the question as well. So can pregnancy make MS worse? So can it actually speed up transition to progressive disease? Um, and there's lots of different studies that has tried to look at this and they, they're a bit mixed because they, and they sometimes hard to, you know, it's hard to get a conclusive message from them because they use different outcome measures. So they'll measure, you know, time to needing a walking stick or time to struggle to walk and, and things like that. Um, so, but overall, if you look at these studies, most of them showed that there was no evidence that getting pregnant after you've been diagnosed with MS can actually affect the way the disease changes over time. So, so I think that's also a very reassuring message. We don't know that much about someone that already has progressive MS um, getting pregnant, but again, um, the signals that we've had at this point is that there isn't any evidence that if you already have a degree of progressive MS, um, that you will, um, you know, get worse if you get pregnant. So the take-home message is therefore is that pregnancy does not neg negatively impact on the long-term MS outcomes. So whether you have relapsing, remitting MS or progressive MS, which can be SPMS, secondary progressive or primary progressive. And also that pregnancy may actually confer benefits for some women with MS. Um, and it does look like the amount of relapses you have before and after the pregnancy is still going to be the biggest predictor of how someone does long term. So again, coming back to, you know, control of the disease going into the pregnancy and again afterwards as well. So um, just interrupt me if there's any questions, Andrea. We're going well so far, Annika. There haven't been any, but it's a good okay. um, opportunity to encourage people to pop their questions in. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I guess the next thing is, you know, what it, does MS affect pregnancy outcomes? So this is again, you know, talking about MS, we're not talking about the disease, the drugs at all, just, you know, MS in general. And, and what we know also from a number of large studies is that babies born from MS mothers can be perhaps slightly smaller by gestational age and by weight, but that doesn't affect their long-term outcome. Um, there's also no difference in the, the baby's um, scores just after birth in, in, um, if, in mom, mom, mothers of, with MS. So the ABCA score is a score that um, is usually given to the baby to say if they, you know, alert and crying and are they pink? 
Um, are they moving? That sort of thing. And there was certainly no evidence at all that these babies were less healthy. Um, there might be a slight increased risk of operative deliveries in, in, in women with MS. So this could be, you know, having a forceps delivery or a vacuum or cesarean section. But I th again, I think this could, a lot of this could actually be perception around um, as someone with MS's ability to do natural births and also perhaps even a little bit of bias on this on the side of health professionals. I guess, you know, for some women with MS, fatigue could become quite an issue during um, delivery um, and having adequate pain relief and hydration is really important. But again, I think that, you know, for most women with MS, they should be able to actively participate in making a birth plan um, without, um, you know, too much worry. There is also, um, very, it's also clear that women with MS who have a baby, there's no increase in birth defects, um, in the, the risk of that baby dying, or any adverse um, fetal outcomes. So the messages are consistently very positive. Um, so let's move on to talking about treatments um, and the effect of these treatments on pregnancy. And I think, you know, to do that, we do have to understand the drugs a little bit and also the duration of the medication um, and its elimination from the body. Um, some of these medications, of course, are out of your body very, very fast, but it can have a long um, effect on your immune system or a long biological effect. Um, and then, you know, it's, I thought it might be good to just talk about how these medications are classified and what it means. And the classifications that's used are, you know, usually noted on the package inserts of these medications, and they're all very standard, and they're all very conservative. Um, so these um, things are um, developed by pharmaceutical companies, and, you, and um, they would be they absolutely very, very careful in how they work these um, things. So, so if you think about how medication is classified, you know, this is usually done at the time that the time that the drug is actually marketed. So the safety data at that point has usually been collected for a few years, so between three and five years usually. And it usually would only, the, these trials are usually done in selected people. So they, they are highly selective um, who tries these medications first. Um, and there's usually very limited use um, in, in children, of course, um, and also if you're pregnant at all, you exclude it from these trials. So we don't, we often have very minimal information and they make these classifications then on the data that's available at that point, which is often very little, and also on animal studies and, and also what the biological, what, what does the drug do? How does it work? Is it possible it can have an, uh, an adverse event? And then they make recommendations based on that. So you can see that this is, a, you know, it's a quite limited in how much information is available. Um, and, we then have a, and then they sort of do this and they never change these classifications again. So even if there happens to be then thousands of pregnancies on a specific medication, um, after what goes to market, these classifications are basically almost never changed, changed because it does require, it would require the pharmaceutical companies to go back to the FDA or the TGA um, and that's a major undertaking and, and cost them quite a bit of money. So I think the other thing to understand is that all pregnancies have a risk of a malformation of about one to 2%. So if you think of the, about the background risk for anybody to have a, a baby that's born with an abnormality, um, like a cleft palate or something like that, it's about one to 2%. So, so this is the categorization of medications. So they, the other thing to note is that it's not really um, in order. So it doesn't always mean that a class C drug is worse than a class B drug or, or vice versa. You know, these things are all sort of categories based on how much information there is on animal data often uh, and very limited information in humans. So um, class A is, is the best one. It's also one at the top. And this one is where there's sort of large women, numbers of pregnant women that's been on this and there's been no problems. So this would be something like paracetamol, for instance. You know, that would be a class A drug. Then we move into the B category. So basically, this basically means that there's not enough human data to, to say that this is safe, um, but there is some animal data and there's some human data, but not enough. So um, B1 would be the best one. So that means that, you know, there's been some the number of women that's been exposed to this medication 
and there's been no abnormalities. And in animal studies, it's been no abnormalities. Um, and then, then B2 means that there's less data available, but there's no adverse events. And B3 means there's been no adverse abnormalities in, in the human data that, they, that we have. But in animal studies, there may be some abnormalities. And remember that in animal studies, when they do this, they give the animals massive amounts of this, the drug. So they give them the super, super normal um, doses to study this. Um, and then class C, um, this is when, you know, a medication, because of it, the way it works, may have an ad adverse abnormality. So again, this could be reversible, you know, so it's not always that, you know, severe at all. So a very broad category. Class D is, the, is when there is a suspicion that it's, um, and a higher suspicion that it might cause abnormalities. Um, and class X, the class X is the ones that you want to avoid. And there's definitely a possibility that these medications can cause malformations. So if you look at the Australian categorization of medications, and it's also important to note that this is different than the US classification. This is a bit different. You can see that even medications such as the interferons, um, have been given a class D um, allocation. Um, you know, Gopaxone is probably, and, and Tecfidera is often given the best, you know, best one from the Bs. Um, and, um, the, you know, the Ds would also be include Fingolimod and Cladribine, um, and then a couple of B3s as well. And it, the only X really to avoid for, um, for certainty would be terafunamide. So, and, uh, you know, so this is kind of quite, you know, very basic information, but something that you will see on package information. And it's good to try and um, you know, understand a bit about how people come to this conclusion. And because your doctor might tell you something different. And then the reason is that we base it on, you know, data that's been collected for a long time after this medication comes, came to market um, and after this classification was assigned to this medication. So it does mean though that we should try and plan this a little bit, um, as much as we can. Um, and this is basically the discontinuation periods before you get pregnant that is recommended by the pharmaceutical company. So basically based on that original data that I talked about, um, and this is often what would be in package inserts and medication information handouts, and is probably the most conservative, conservative estimates of what you should be doing. So if you look at the half-life, so this is this column over here, this tells you what, how long does it take for the 50% of the drug to be out of your system completely? And it varies quite a bit. So you can see that, you know, for Tecfidera, dimethyl fumarate, it's out of your body within 50% is eliminated within in an hour of taking it. But then for something like, say, um, you know, Ocrelizumab, Ocrevus, that can take 33 weeks to eliminate. Um, so it can vary quite a bit. Um, and therefore, they, they usually will, you know, times these by two or three times to sort of give you an idea. But it doesn't always make sense because you can see for alemtuzumab, even though the drug is out of your body within, say, four days, you shouldn't get pregnant for four months. Um, cladribine is out, out of your system in 5.4 hours, but the biological of the effect, the effect of the drug sort of suggests that we should wait longer and that it could take, you should wait six months after taking it to get pregnant. Um, so, um, and then for something say like Tysabri, they would sort of, the package insert would say two to three months, but we generally don't do this anymore. So you can see that all of this, these things are very conservative um, and um, is not really something that is commonly done anymore in clinical practice. Um, as we mostly now, from data that we know about, since these drugs came to market, we'll continue most of these medications until someone's actually pregnant and sometimes even during pregnancy. So, but I did thought that I'd show you the sort of most conservative version of this. So things to consider, you know, when you're gonna, you know, stop someone's medications potentially for pregnancy is that everyone is different and time to get pregnant is different for everybody and we can't predict it. Um, and I think if it's possible and for the right person, you know, it is a good idea to withdraw drugs before conception, but you do have a significant risk that someone could have ongoing or rebound disease activity that can put the mother at risk. And as we showed before, if you do have relapses and so forth going into a pregnancy, that can affect your life for quite a few years during and after the pregnancy. So, um, so it's, um, 
you know, even though, so conservatively, yes, we should think about stopping the medication, but practically we often don't. Planning is really important. Um, and for some women, you know, especially those with high disease activity, we often would actually um, continue therapy until they're pregnant or actually even throughout the pregnancy sometimes, um, because we know that, um, you know, someone has um, very active disease or they did before they started on a specific medication. So if we think about pregnancy in general, we know that most people find um, out that they're pregnant after they've missed their first period. So you're often sort of about four to six weeks after implantation. Um, and um, by this point, a fair bit of um, organ formation has already um, happened. Um, but this continues throughout pregnancy. Um, also the growth of the organs, all of these things continues throughout pregnancy. But generally, you can see major, you know, malformations um, because of medication exposure um, in the early weeks, you know, quite clearly, there's usually a signal that comes through. And reassuringly, none of the MS drugs have, to have been shown to have any specific malformations as associated with them, which is very reassuring. And, and I think, you know, all the positive information I've just given you has been re is really reflected in, in clinical practice. So we can see that this message ar ar around pregnancy, the safety of getting pregnant, um, and the safety of the medications is coming through quite clearly. So if we look at this graph here, and um, what we can see um, is that there are increasingly numbers of women getting pregnant um, while they're on a disease-modifying treatment. So if we look back, to 2005, you know, in this study, there was no pregnant, no woman that got pregnant on, on medication, so they'd all been stopped. But if we look now in 2016, you can see that more than 60% of these women actually were, was on a disease-modifying treatment when they got pregnant. Um, and most people would have had something during that year. So you can definitely see that, um, you know, uh, the doctor's comfort level and the, the patient's person with MS comfort level to stay on these medication while they're getting pregnant is um, increasing. And this is because of all the, the better information and the reassuring messaging messages that we have. So we can see that, um, and, and we know that the average um, amount um, of exposure was about four weeks for, for most of these women. So how do we decide if a medication is actually safe? You know, how many pregnancies do you have to have on a medication to know if there really is going to be a problem or not? And this is sort of something that Dr. Kirsten Helwig, she's someone we collaborate with quite closely in Germany, and she um, works a lot on, um, you know, collecting this information. Um, and how many you need, how many pregnancies you need to record on a medication? It will also depend. To know for sure that it's safe depends on the type of malformation you're talking about. So if, for instance, we talk about um, a relatively common um, malformation, so say something like um, um, a uh, cardiovascular defect like this, so that's, you know, in the population, one in 115 babies will be born with a, um, a, a heart defect. Um, we know that to, to know for sure that no MS drug will cause that, you need about 2,000, um, more than 2,000 pregnancies um, to, to um, know for sure. If we're talking about something rarer, so say cleft palate, um, um, a cleft lip without a cleft palate, you would actually, because this is rarer in the general population, you need about 17,000 pregnancies recorded on a medication to know this for sure. Um, so where we're at with most medications is probably most of the medications would have between about, you know, um, you know, 200 to 600 um, pregnancies have been recorded while someone has been exposed to the medication. So we can already talk about low birth rate, abortion rates, fetal death and major birth defects. So there's a lot of things we can actively exclude, but there might be some rare, very rare things that we still um, don't, we can't, we think it's going to be okay, but you can't say with absolute certainty. And this is often, um, you know, which is becomes hard when you have to balance this bit because even though we know a lot, there's still things we don't know. And this is why discussing this with your doctor is so important. Um, so, so what I thought I'd show you is, you know, I showed you all these conservative recommendations, but I now also thought I'd show you what we currently would mostly do in real practice 
with these medications. So I guess if we think about interferons, um, so this is the you know Rebirth, um, Betaferon, Plegredi, all those medications, Avonex, and Copaxone, we would not stop this before before pregnancy. We would let people can generally stop it when they're actually pregnant. Um, there are also cases where it's continued throughout pregnancy, and it's thought that it's probably safe to breastfeed using these medications because the molecules are very big, and they can't even if they come through in the breast milk, they won't be absorbed by the baby. But again, this is not what I'm saying we should do. We should discuss it with your own doctor. Terafunamide, so there's now been about 130 pregnancies, um, and despite it actually having this X category, right? So, and again, there's not been no specific malformation, but if you think about our previous slide, we're not sort of even over the 200 mark yet. Um, if we think about terafunamide has a sister drug called lefunamide, there's about 100 pregnancies recorded in that one. Um, but and again, there's not really any malformation pattern. So if you put them together, you know, then you can say, well, there's probably not going to be any malformation here, uh, a major malformation anyway. But at this stage, the recommendation would be to stop um, the medication or switch it to a different medication if you're going to get pregnant um, and wash it out if you accidentally get pregnant. Tecfidera, so this has now got about 300 pregnancies that's been documented with, with women exposed to this medication. Um, and again, there's not been any signal yet for fetal abnormalities. So again, we would continue this until someone is actually pregnant. Um, you could potentially continue it throughout pregnancy, but most times um, that's not done. Um, Galenia or Fingolimod, so you would remember that this has a classification um, D um, in the pregnancy classification and it's recommended that you should, should wash it out for two months before you get pregnant. Um, there's about 500 pregnancies now that's been recorded where women were exposed to Fingolimod and there's been no increase in malformations. So this is um, again quite reassuring but the recommendation is still that you should stop this before you get pregnant and, and not to breastfeed um, when you're on Galenia because it's a small molecule and it probably could get into the baby's bloodstream. Um, so, um, so often when you're on these, this medication, you'll probably be switched to something um, different uh, before you get pregnant. But, you know, if something happens, it's not the end of the world, which is always good. Cladribine, so this is our newest play on the block. So this one is potentially thought to be toxic to, to genes. Um, so, and there's very few pregnancies that's been recorded. So it's still very early days. There's about 44 pregnancies now recorded in 38 women. Um, and of these women, um, uh, many of them ended up having a, a elective termination or a miscarriage. Um, as you um, you know just because you know that's the normal rate according to normal rate and the ones that did go ahead um, with the pregnancies um, there was no malformations recorded um, but at this stage it is still recommended um, to not to get pregnant for six months after having cladribine which you know it seems overly strict because it's out of your system so quickly and you can actually breastfeed um, after you've a week after you've had cladribine. So it's interesting the, the sort of mixed messages there, but probably most neurologists will still stick to this guideline at the moment. If we think about natalizumab, um, so this is a, there's about 500 pregnancies now recorded with people exposed to that. Um, and there hasn't been an increase on, uh, you know, to any specific malformation at all. And you can stop this at when you get pregnant, but it's often also used throughout pregnancy for people who's thought to need to need it. And it also um, seems that it might be safe to breastfeed when you um, are back on natalizumab because it's such a big molecule again. So it can't be absorbed by the baby, even if tiny concentrations get into the breast milk. So um, yeah, so one that we quite, so this is probably the one that we very often will use as um, a preference before someone gets pregnant. Ocrelizumab or Ocrevus, this is our six monthly infusion, again, less than 50 pregnancies exposed that has been recorded, um, no malformations, but again, it is recommended that you don't get pregnant on this um, for at least six months after your last dose, and I think most of us would probably stick to that for now. And then Alentuzumab or Lentrida, again, not many pregnancies recorded um, to women exposed to Alentuzumab. So this would be someone exposed to Alentuzumab and then they get pregnant within, um, during, the, during the infusions itself or in the first month or so after the infusions. Um, so 
um, and and in the and these and even though there haven't been any major malformations, they did record a, um, a, a few babies that got autoimmune problems later on. So it is a, um, advisable to at least not get pregnant for four months after you have that second dose. So um, I thought I would just uh, mention um, about staying on um, Tysabri or natalizumab throughout pregnancy because this is also something that is not uncommonly done now. Um, and basically, this is coming from Germany, and, and what, what they studied here um, was 24 pe people who had Tysabri throughout pregnancy, um, and all of them had a normal um, live birth. There was no birth defects, um, and this gestational age and the birth weight of these babies was similar to those um, women with MS that had were not exposed to disease-modifying treatment. Um, and there were five babies that were recorded to have some sort of blood abnormality, which was very mild, and they all resolved by themselves. So this would be something like low platelets, um, a little bit of anemia, and a little bit, um, one baby with a little bit of a low um, white cell count, and they all just resolved with monitoring and were not serious. Um, so they all, um, so it was very sort of reassuring. Um, and then just looking a bit more closely at these blood counts in the baby, it does seem like the risk of this can be um, managed by actually stopping about when, depending on when you stop the Tysabri. So if you actually um, stop the Tysabri before 24 weeks, in column one, there was only one um, hematological abnormality, but that's gonna leave the mum unprotected for quite a long time. If you stop it before 30 weeks, it does increase. But interestingly, before or after 30 weeks, there wasn't actually much of a difference. So it looks, um, you know, like that the recommendation now is that we could probably continue with the Tysabri up to about 34 weeks. And that's certainly what the German um, specialists are doing at the moment. So, so it's all, all, all a very feasible option for some people. Just about steroids and breastfeeding. So we know that, um, you know, that there is a, some steroids that could come through into breast milk um, and it usually um, it's the peak is early on and after four hours after say a dose of steroids for a relapse and um, whether it's intravenously or orally the dose will be very low so um, and after eight hours even less um, so so you could actually express and discard breast milk um, in the first few hours after the dose um, to limit this exposure. What about MRI scans? So we know that there's not been any um, risks or abnormal, ab you know, risk to the fetus from having a MRI scan of the brain or spine during pregnancy, but we would usually avoid giving any contrast agent. And breastfeeding itself, if you've given contrast, um, the gadolinium or the contrast agent with the MRI, it can actually get into the breast milk. Um, and it's possibly in theory that the baby could absorb this. Um, so generally we would say if you need contrast and you're actually breastfeeding, you can express and discard again for the first four hours after having that dose, but generally thought to be safe. What about IVF? So um, we know that about 1% of live births a year is uh, born through IVF. And there's been a few small studies looking at this. Um, and it looks like, you know, being on IVF and sort of a lot of different hormones can increase your relapse rate um, and also MRI activity of MS, especially after an unsuccessful cycle. So as you can imagine, an unsuccessful cycle, you can almost like, you know, imagine it being sort of like a miscarriage or, you know, a, a, a termination in some ways with the hormonal fluctuations. And it does also depend on what type of um, IVF is used, on the type of drugs so generally, you know, for our, our patients, and I know for my patients who has to go through this, um, we don't, um, we usually would put them on a medication that they can continue up until they're actually pregnant because it's just safer and you avoid all of these fluctuations um, during IVF with, um, that is already incredibly um, stressful. Um, so, um, and we would generally not tell the obstetricians what to do with which, which one they choose because, um, you know, it's very tricky and we just want our patients to get pregnant. So I guess planning is important. It's good to have a discussion about what medication you're on. Can you continue it um, until you're pregnant? Um, should you stop it before you get pregnant? And if you do, is there anything safer that might be worthwhile considering? 
And then also, you know, should you continue your medication throughout pregnancy? And this is particularly with natalizumab where this comes on and it's becoming um, more and more um, practice to do that, um, especially for um, some women that has had, you know, a fair bit of disease activity. Um, but we have to balance this all very carefully um, and um, we have to think about the person and where they're at as well. So just about breastfeeding. So this has been sort of a debate that's been going on for quite some years. But increasingly, if we look at the information and all the different studies that's been doing now, it does look like some of these studies, you know, probably most have been neutral, but there's been probably two good studies which shown that exclusive breastfeeding so breastfeeding pretty much, you know, without giving anything else um, is protective if you do this for six months. But as someone who's done that, it's not always easy. And if you, and if you are someone with MS where fatigue is a big issue, um, you know, it's um, one of the things that might be protective um, and might not be for everybody. What about the chances that a baby will get MS if the mum has MS? So this will, of course, again, we're looking at you know studies in big populations and we know that there's some genetic component to MS but it's not a big component at all so even if you look at identical twins up here where they share 100% of genes you can see that the risk of the of both of if one twin has MS that the other one will get MS is about 30% so by no means um, you know a very high genetic um, effect at all if you have a, um, a child of a parent with MS, so there's about 50% of that child's genetic information maybe comes from a parent with MS, um, then they basically would have an increase of about 2% um, compared to the non-MS population. So which is increased to the general population, you know. So the risk is not as low as in the, if the mom didn't have MS, but it's still actually really low. Um, and the further away the relative is, the less risk there is. So I guess the thing to think about, you know, is, is there a way to prevent MS? Um, and this is, of course, a big field of study, um, you know, thinking about what makes someone susceptible to get MS. And there's so much that we don't know. It's such a big puzzle. But it's very clear that genes is just a very small part of this and environmental factors could play a role. And probably the ones that we know about would probably be vitamin D. So, it's, you know, be making sure you have a high, high, high enough vitamin D levels when you're pregnant with your baby. Um, and also maybe thinking about the baby's vitamin D levels um, and as a young adult um, as well. Um, the child should not smoke. Um, or And it also looks like overweight, being overweight as a teenager um, can increase your risk. So I guess it's sort of setting, you know, an example of a healthy lifestyle to your children might be beneficial to them long term and to yourself, of course. But things like EBV exposure, which is, of course, uh, thought to be quite a high risk um, thing, there's not really anything we can do to protect um, our children from this at the moment. So we're just looking at vitamin D in pregnancies. So there's, um, you know, quite a bit of studies here, but looking at this one from a Finnish MS registry. So, you know, these are really good registries because everyone is in it. So you don't have an opt out option when you're a Finn. Um, and they looked at mum's um, D, vitamin D samples um, taken during the first trimester. And they showed that if the mum had low vitamin D in early pregnancies, it can double the risk of having MS. Um, in the babies, um, whereas if they um, had, um, so these are just the different cutoff levels, so they use a different measurement than we do in Australia, so you can't really compare it directly. But basically, if you have your vitamin D levels, you know, above 60, really, which is not, we usually would aim for even higher, it does appear to reduce the risk of the baby getting MS. So good to think about. So yeah, Perhaps, so breastfeeding could be good. The risk of the baby um, to get MS, if you have MS, slightly increased, but still really low. And it's worth to think about modifiable risk factors in general. Um, so what about parenting as a person with MS? So we know that motherhood in general, especially if it's your first child and, you know, even with second kids, you know, let's face it, it's kind of exponential with the second child, it doesn't just double. You know, there's always a fear, and I think even for non-MS non mothers you know, or parents, there's a big fear about, you know, can I do this? And I think, you know, I remember how anxious I was with my first baby. Um, 
you know, having these extra fears about, will I cope? What will my MAs be like? What am I going to do with my medication? Should I be on medication? You know, all of these things um, makes things a bit more complicated, but it doesn't mean that that is not possible, of course. And I, I've seen many, many mothers with MS parent and they are amazing, you know, um, but it is demanding and it's good to think about, you know, what is the main problems that you think you might have um, and thinking about your support network, um, and making sure you sort of have a little bit of a plan um, knowing that there's just so much here that you can't plan. It's much more unpredictable um, and how everybody is so different again um, when um, we're talking about, you know, what the baby will be like, how much will they sleep, how will you cope? Um, but I think fear, sharing your fears and your hopes and your experiences with other people in the same situation can really help. Um, and there's also lots of support available. You know, MS Australia has information on their website um, and there's um, lots of um, resources to access um, that could support someone. Um, so in terms of um, developing and coping in children of people, people with MS, it's quite clear that um, early childhood development um, has not, is not affected by, the, by a parent having MS, um, but it could be probably be more affected um, by the mental health of that parent. So looking after yourself is really important. You know, what babies need is a happy, healthy mum as much as possible for, you know, and no one can be that 100%. So um, just as much as, as we all can. And um, all of us, um, you know, our behaviour and our, our mental health affects that of our children. So people with MS is no different. So things to think about and to ask your doctor is basically you think about, a, if you're starting to think about getting pregnant or you're already pregnant or, you know, all of those things, it's good to think about a forward looking pl treatment plan, you know. So if you know you're going to get pregnant and then, or you're going to really try, start to start trying in the next six months, it's probably not a good idea to start on a Obagio, for instance, because you will definitely have to come off it. Um, um, it's also really important to balance the risk to the fetus caused by the drug exposure and to the risk of the mother. Um, and, you know, I think increasingly with the knowledge that we have about the medications, we are continuing medications until someone is pregnant um, and also sometimes during pregnancy um, with very good outcomes. And then also thinking about what's going to happen after delivery. Are you going to just start back on your medication very soon? Are you going to breastfeed? Um, and also the medication that you, um, you know, want to go back on or that you're on, can you do that while you're breastfeeding? Um, so there are sort of answers around all of these things that are generally a much um, more, um, uh, there's much more choice than the actual package inserts and the pharmacological companies would suggest to you. So, so in summary, I think, you know, that it's always good to, to talk about these things, to try and make a plan, knowing that there's lots of things we can't plan. Most women with MS will have normal pregnancies, and we know that the disease itself doesn't pose a risk to the baby or the, uh, to the baby in particular. Um, generally, it's a good time with decreased relapses, um, and you can have an epidural, you can breastfeed, um, and it's good to, um, you know, generally we would continue disease modifying treatments, or most of them until someone is pregnant, sometimes during pregnancy. Um, and if you stop the medication, it could be harmful to the mother. Um, there's also no treatment at the moment that we can prevent a postpartum relapse with necessarily. Um, and yeah, breastfeeding might be beneficial. So I think that's all I have to say. So I might stop there. <laughs> Annika, that's fantastic. You have been so thorough in all the things that you've talked about today. Um, and there, there is one question that's come in, so bear with me, I'm just going to get my, come back to a thank you slide. Sorry, that was a bit clumsy. Um, there's been a question, do you know, is there any difference or have, has any of the research been carried out between older mums and younger mums? Uh, no, no, but that is an excellent question. Um, I think with the information we have at the moment, you would think that, you know, it should be the same as it would be for any older mum or any younger mum. So I don't think that that specifically would, you know, be different for someone with MS. Um, so, yeah, I can't, I, you know, but it's, it's interesting. We, we are actually doing, you know, quite a bit of pregnancy research um, yeah. in MS and it's um, something that we're planning to look at. 
That's great. Um, look, I'm sure Annika can stay a minute or so if people want to throw in a question. I, I'll just talk through a couple of slides. Um, Annika mentioned there, there is, there's lots of information and lots of uh, support and advice available through MS. So feel free to contact us for further information. Uh, just to make you aware that we do have some eBooks available. And if you're interested in any of those, they, you can contact MS Connect to get the information on how to borrow those. This one's just, uh, again, a reminder of another tool that might be useful to you. Now, this was a tool that was developed for the ACT. So a lot of the services that are in it are ACT specific, but a lot of the information about symptom management crosses all states. So that, again, just to be aware of. And also just a mention of financial assistance. Now this doesn't certainly doesn't apply to any, everybody, but it's a service that we know is a little bit uh, fluid. Sometimes there's money available, sometimes there's not. But if you find yourself in a situation where you could do with some, you're, you're facing some financial hardship and you could do with some money to support, uh, oftentimes it's things like the purchase of an air conditioner that doesn't fit under any other government schemes, but we can provide a, a bit of support, not fully cover the amount, but help with that. So it's a bit of a random program, but that's there for you to be aware of. And no other questions have come in, so I think oh. we are at the end. Thank you okay. so much, Annika. Oh, wait on, sorry, there's another, there is a question, I missed it. Okay. Does breastfeeding help protect babies against developing an autoimmune disorder? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think there's, you know, if we look at the, through the literature, we probably would find evidence that, you know, breastfeeding in general um, protects babies against lots of things. Um, so, but I'm, I, I can't really give you a percentage though in what that would be. I think that it's more, the, the protection that breastfeeding offers is often more to do with protection against infectious diseases. Um, and it does also seem to have a protective effect against allergies. Um, and, you know, that's about as far as my knowledge goes on the topic. But again, yeah, very interesting um, mm. to speak about. That's great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for spending time with us today and thank you again Annika for sharing that wealth of information and covering off so many areas related to pregnancy and uh, having babies. So we're very appreciative for your time. Thanks everyone. Okay. Good luck everyone. A, we'll see you at a future program. Thank you. Okay.